Oh, <laughs> I, I blanked out for a second. Hello, my fellow readers. This is I, Dark Symphony 777 with our fan fiction review. As always, the link to the store will be in the description below. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, click on that bell for notifications, leave a comment in the comment section below on your thoughts on the fan fiction and any future fan fictions you want me to read or review. And finally, this is my own this is my own opinion. My opinion is not indicative of everyone in the remote in the world. So please respect that. So, there are stories that, you know, people kind of love for nostalgia reasons, like, their first, like, a, like this, and it, and it extends to anything. Like, this was the first thing I had, this was, like, the first thing that made me cry, so to speak. Uh, with fan fiction, there are, you know, there, there are a couple, there are a couple things like that, like, Better Off Alone, favorite fan fiction, first fan fiction to get an emotional reaction out of me, because I cried, like, how, like, <laughs> several times throughout the story because I really love that story. Um, uh, there was Ballad of Squiggly, which was the first fan I technically worked on, uh, mainly because, you know, the author, he needed help with the fan, with the fight scenes, and I helped him out with that. Um, there was Only a Girl, which was the fan fiction that kind of inspired me to do this channel. Like, I really, really loved that story, and I thought, hey, I could do a review on this. Hey, wait a minute. I can do a review on it. And I did and I did do reviews on all three of those stories. Well, uh, yeah, all three of those stories plus the trilogy and only a girl. But now it's time for the final one. It's been a long time coming. I've been wanting to review this forever. I will now be reviewing the Super Koopa Tetralogy by Wakazu. The reason this story is so nostalgic is... Wakasu was my first pen pal, my first online friend. I'm not exactly, if you notice, I don't exactly, you know, leave the links to, like, anything in my comment section, like, or link, I used to do a Discord, but I was like, uh, I got tired of doing the Discord, plus, I, it's pretty obvious no one's really gonna be joining it, so I was like, eh, I, I just, I'll just give up on Discord. Uh, not to mention, Discord was just completely wasting my time away from actually reading, so... Not not to mention, my boss really doesn't want me to use Discord. Mainly mainly because it keeps distracting her, and I really <laughs> she really doesn't like it when my phone's constantly ringing, what is a man, a miserable little pile of secrets every five seconds. So she got really tired of that. Um, so... You know, I don't, I don't use Twitter. I never trust, I never, I stopped liking Twitter. I used it for like a hot second and it's like, this is boring, piece of time. And I never really trusted Facebook. I still won't trust Facebook. I will never trust Facebook. I think Marcos, Mark Zuckerberg is a piece of shit. That's just me. I never, I, I just, I look, one look at Facebook and it's like, no, 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 no. I'm using that. Um, I only use Discord, not Discord. I only used Discord because my friend wanted me to. It's like uh, I got bored of it. Uh, the only, the only like social media I kind of use is, fan, is related to fan fiction. So mainly just fanfiction.net or FIM fiction or archive of our own. If you want to message me there, if you can message me there, I'm not too familiar with our Ao3 that much. Um, but you know I was good friends with Walker too. And then in 2016, you know she passed away. And you know I kind of, I you know. Shit happens. I was too busy with my life and everything to happen about it. Uh, so I didn't know until recently. But I wanted to honor her and talk about the stories that she loved. And so I thought, I already did Marion Luigi and Bowser. I thought, I'll talk about these four stories because these were the stories that kind of made me, you know, kind of be friends with her. So I thought, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. So the first fan fiction is the prequel to the main bulk of the story. Uh, and that is the Queen of the Koopas. Now, this is a prequel to the Super Koopa series. And it's supposed to, like, set up the events of the three main stories. Super Koopa, Super Koopa Land, and Super Koopa World. And I think, overall, in an overarching view, if you just take Queen of the Koopas by itself, it's not bad. But if you take it in context to the other three stories, like, if you mash them all four together... Then you kind of got it. Then it kind of starts cracking. Not completely like breaking. It doesn't become a bad story, but it shows that it hasn't aged as well as the Super Koopa stories. So let's get started. So the plot starts with a younger Bowser. Not King Bowser, but Prince Bowser. 
Because he he's still young. He's like he hasn't and he's not become an adult yet. Uh, and he's getting tired of all these marriage proposals by Kamek saying, You must marry her! Marry her! Marry her! And no, it's like, No, I want a dragon Koopa queen. I want someone who I can I can be toe to toe with and, and fight and do stuff with Dragon Koopa stuff. And so he he goes to the abandoned ruins of his father's castle. Uh, King Morton Koopa, and then he runs into this lady named Balzelta Perikiri. Now, Balzelta Perikiri is a female dragon Koopa, and Bowser kind of falls in love with her. He's like, I love you. Marry me. And she's like, no. And so Bowser kind of becomes friends. And so we kind of get this whole romance period where Bowser's trying to woo Balzelta, and eventually she kind of gets won over. Uh, she's revealed to have been a thief that wants to kill Bowser because her fa because Bowser's father staged a massive coup, uh, uniting all the clans uh, in the Dark Clans, but ruining the other royals' lives. So it's like I'm the undisputed king of Darkland. Do what I say. Oh, and you, you lost all your titles and, and, and riches and stuff. But do what I say! And, you know, she was bitter about that over the fact, you know, her parents, you know, they, they had their lives ruined. And by extension, they ruined her life because <clears throat> we, we want to be spoiled. And so she became a thief. And, you know. And Kamek didn't really trust her because where does she come from? Why is she doing this? She wants to kill you. And Bowser's was like, no, nah, you just got to warm up with her. And so Bowser finally, you know, falls in love with Bowser and starts working under him. You know, you know, Bowser's like, I want to, you know, I want her to be my advisor. And like, mm. and then Bowser sends Kamek away because Kamek, you know, Kamek is, cr is cramping Bowser's styles. Like, I can't deal with this anymore. Go away. Okay. <laughs> and sends him off to a, to lead a battle against Sarzoland. Sarzoland being, you know, Daisy's kingdom. Uh, and over these mountains called the Koopalingas. And so Bowser, you know, Kamek's trying to communicate and also sends Kami Koopa over to kind of watch him. But Kami's like, I like you. <laughs> and she's like, I like you too. Let's be friends. Okay, Bowser. Da -da 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 -da. I'm quirky like that. Kami is quirky. Um, so, you know, they're fighting, and then Bowser kind of, you know, starts becoming, you know, a strategic person, wanting to show up Kamek. And so, you know, manages to get all eight Koopalinga Mountains away from Zarazar through, like, manipulating everything around her. Because that's, that's Bowser's M.O., just constant manipulation of everything around her. And then, you know, marries Bowser with the intent of, I want eight kids. For getting married, I want eight kids. One for each mountain I got for you. It's like, okay. <laughs> and then we get to the second half of the story where Bowser is giving birth to the Koopalings. In fact, they even a story lit ta um the uh, Bowser even provides an in-story explanation of why she's calling them the Koopalings. Because they're based off the Koopalingas. Yeah. That's a thing. And so, you know, we're getting uh, we got each individual couple, uh, coupling birth, you know, starting with Ludwig, ending with Junior, and, you know, everything that's going on, and then, you know, they start their plans, they dealt with Sarzaland, they realize is not going to attack them anymore, because they got screwed over, so it's like, let's attack the Mushroom Kingdom, and everyone's like, yeah, and then the Mario Brothers show up, like, no, <laughs> And then we get pretty much plots and villainous reasons from multiple Mario games. We got Mario World, Super Mario One, uh, Mario, well, Super Mario. There we go. Uh, Super Mario Two, which was referenced. Super Mario Three, you know, the one where they go over the islands and they fight the Koopalings. Uh, Super Mario World, which is actually interesting because in story. The Koopas actually already own that. They they already own all that plan. They're just they just want to say, hey, we want to. They just want to do it to cheer up the army, you know. So they pretend to invade the dinosaur lands where you know the Yoshi's lived and everything, and say, you know, we, we're just gonna be, we're just gonna rebuild the castle, pretend pretend we're taking over, and then Bowser dumb goofs and, and kidnaps Princess Peach because he panicked. Uh, and so Mario and Luigi show up and just kick everyone's ass a again. And then Super Mario 64, where we get to the crux of the themes. And I didn't really... Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit. 
Uh, and, you know, with Bow, you know, when Mario ba beats up Bowser again. And they also reference some game uh, that, that takes place with Mario using the Super Scope. I, I, don't, I don't know that game, I, honestly. And so Bowser uh, is getting furious over the fact that, you know, Mario, no matter what happens, keeps getting one up on, the ba on Bowser. And then during the final battle... In Super Mario 64, when Bowser's going to breathe fire, he breathes coins instead, and Bowser gets pissed, revealing, you know, kind of telling everyone, it's like, it's not Mario that's winning, it's the stars that are making him win. And so she's cursing the star spirits for constantly rigging everything against Bowser and making sure Mario wins no matter what. So we kind of got a little wrinkle in the whole thing. So after uh, Mario 64, ba uh, Bowser gives birth to... Uh, to Bowser Jr., and then goes off on a mission, because she kind of got a hint over uh, some way she can get rid of Mar Mario and Luigi, and so she comes across this portal she, you know, that she accidentally activates because she actually has an heirloom from her family, which is actually opens up the portal. And so that causes her to kind of go into the real world, i.e. Earth, and Bowser's kind of kind of mourns for her by con by kind of uh, giving, like, forgetting about her, like, throws away all her stuff in, in a little corner, uh, wills, her, wills himself to kind of give up and, you know, starts becoming obsessed with beating Mario and kidnapping Peach because, you know, he's lonely and he just, and he, and he just really wants some companionship and he thinks Peach will fill that void. And it's all framed by this kind of act at the beginning, the middle, and the end where... Uh, Bowser, you know, kidnaps Peach again, and then teases her over the events of Super Paper Mario with the marriage that Count Black did, and then Ludwig calling out her father, calling out his father, saying, you gotta stop that. You stop that. You stop that. What would, what would, what would, what would Martha think? What would Martha think? It's like, what would she, I don't know. And then Peach, like, confused. And then Ludwig gets hurt, and Bowser and Peach, uh, you know, try to check up on him, but Mario Brothers think, you know, Bowser's going after Peach again, and then they, you know, they kind of hurt him. And that's the overall plot. Like I said, if you take it, if you take the story in isolation, it's not a bad plot, but if you connect this with the other three stories in the trilogy, in the tetralogy, then that's where you get to see the cracks, and that is the idea of themes. Usually when it comes to a prequel, the, uh, the main idea for the prequel is to set up established themes that are going to appear or that are already going that have already been appeared and try and connect them and you know give us a starting point. And there are a couple of, of themes that you know that this story introduces. First off, uh, consequences of your actions will you know come back to haunt you. Family, um, good and, and most importantly, good and evil is not black and white because. As we see later in throughout the, the trilogy, uh, Bowzelda is of the, of the one of the people that was trying to really uh, do bad things for good reasons. Because, you know, she wants to help her people out, but the only way to do that is to take over the other countries. But that gets more explored in the trilogy, in the, the main bulk of the story, the Super Koopa trilogy. And that's where the biggest problem of the story lies. Is the off, uh, Wakazu had some good ideas. She really did have good ideas. They were just not executed right. She had a really bad habit of kind of butchering the execution of the ideas she wanted to do. So first off, good and evil is not black and white. We don't really get that. We don't really get that until the end of the of Super Koopa, where Balzella is kind of talking to Peach. And so, you know, we only kind of get hinted at it in Queen of the Koopas. It's not, we, we need to know what the themes is. We don't really, all the themes have to start with the prequel. If the, if later themes come along in the story, then that's fine. But this story hinted at that idea, but we weren't really introduced to it. So it was a, it was a half-baked, you know, kind of a half-cocked uh, theme that really only starts getting until the end of the first, of the second story. Uh, family, this one's kind of half big too, mainly because we're not given time to truly connect with the Koopalings, and the Koopalings are very key to Balzella's uh, character arc. 
the, and the fact that, you know, the moment she gives birth to that, she immediately just goes back to work and just shoves off the kid, especially in the later stories where the, over the course of the, of the series, the Koopalings kind of become more and more important until the, until the second, until the third story where they become pretty much the Koopalings and Bowser and Bowser are, are all main characters, like 10, 11, 11 main characters if you count Cammy. But Cammy's more of a major character. That's that is a lot of, to juggle, and the fact that Wakazu didn't really start things off by having Bowser kind of kind of connect individually with each Koopaling, and the only thing we got out of the Koopalings is you know start of their personalities. Like when Ludwig was born, uh, they were playing Beethoven, and so he kind of fell in love with the music. Hence why he you know he has the buck tooth and the hair. And he has the he has the axe. He has the best of an accent. Mother, mo mother must be proud of me. You, you are, you are beneath me. You know he has that. And you know Mount Morton's motor mouth. Everyone was arguing when he woke up, and so he started babbling, and so he kind of become he kind of became that. You know that's all fine and dandy, but we don't. But we needed to see Bowser kind of connect with each individual Koopa. Bowser Jr., you know, makes sense because, you know, she, you know, because of the events of Super uh, Mario Sunshine with Bowser just wondering who her mother is. So her banning Bowser, that makes sense in the context of the story and what happens in the future. So that one makes sense. The other eight, the other seven don't make sense. It just really doesn't. And finally, um, good evil not valuable, family, oh, and uh, consequences coming back to haunt you. This one is the only one that kind of makes sense, because they continuously ignored Cam uh, Kamek throughout the story, and that kind of causes a feedback loop over, and the main overarching theme is this theme, and it kind of starts off at least on a good enough note. That I'm not gonna bash this one. The other two themes, I'm gonna bash because they just they're just really bad if you take them in context the rest of the series. Uh, because throughout the story, they constantly shove Kamek out of their minds because like ah uh, he'll wi he'll wise up. He'll he'll know he'll 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 turn a new leaf, he'll we'll just ignore him. And in the second story, Super Koopa, that comes back to haunt them really bad and constantly kinda comes back to haunt continues to come back to haunt them as the story goes as each story goes along. Um, especially, you know, as, you know, their consequences of, you know, doing these uh, obviously bad things constantly comes back to haunt them with the Mario Brothers being introduced and the star spirits getting involved and manipulating the events. I thought that theme was set up perfectly. The other two themes, they're not set up good enough. I don't really, they're just not really good enough. Characters. We have four characters. We have Balzetta, Bowser, Cammy, and Kamek. Kamek is a douchebag. He, he his character is basically he thinks the world of Morton Koopa. He thinks the world about his father and constantly compares everything he does and everything Bowser does to what would Morton do. Like if and he's constantly comparing Bowser. You got to be more like your father. What do you, what your father think? You got to be exactly like your father. And Bowser, and hence why this whole plot kicks off because Bowser's just had it. And I said, no, I don't want to be like my father. I want to be Bowser. I don't want to be Morton the second. I want to be Bowser. And so, you know, you know, the whole plot kicks off with Bowser just having just just having enough of Kamek's bullshit. Uh, but Kamek is done at least decently well. I have no problems with Kamek. Um Kamek is, you know, throughout the entire story, she's he's constantly trying to tell Bowser, said, "You gotta do this. Your your father wouldn't, you know, wouldn't trust her. Your your father is like," and Bowser had to keep rebutting her, him, because like I, I keep forgetting that Kamek's a guy. Uh, it's like, no, you shut up, just stop it, just stop it, and and Kamek's like, fine, fine, and you know that that starts the theme of all their consequences come back to bite them. Cammy. Cammy is the cool in this story is the cool old lady. She she basically was hired by Cammy said, keep an eye on him. I don't trust them. She she may ruin Bowser's life and kill him. And Cammy's like, alright. And so and so she goes about the castle. She she sees Bowser and she's like, I like you! <laughs> I like 
you a lot. Your wretchedness. I, I love, I've, and Cammy's basically this, the, the, the stereotypical cool old grandma that, you know, may seem embarrassing on first glance, but then she starts doing all these insanely charitable stuff. It's like, you have a cool old grandma. It's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, Bowser is Bowser. He's brash. He's in your face. He's, well, he's a prince, not a king. Um, and, you know, he's very vain. He's, he's Bowser. He, he's Bowser. You, you can't really go wrong with Bowser. He's Bowser. You know, you know, he, he starts off kind of, you know, headstrong a little bit, but then he turns into Bowser we all know and love throughout, over the course of the story until at the end, we get the Bowser we love. The whole princess infatuated, overly vain, tanky guy who's full of ham and cheese. Sweet! And then finally we end with why is my elbow broke out? And then finally we get to Balzelda. Balzelda is an anomaly. She's very much a weird character. She's everything in some ways she's a Bowser's copy, but in other ways she's Bowser's opposite. So, like, you know, Bra Bowser is brash in your face, very faint, vain, and loves the spotlight. Balzelda is over is cautious. She she plans everything out. She's not exactly a fan of, of public speaking. She likes to be in the foreground. She's also incredibly smart, while Bowser is, you know, he, he comes up with, like, kind of dumb stuff. Uh, and she's not very vain. Bowser is, you know, very, li likes to prove that he, you know, he, Better than at the end of the day, he he's kind of he kind of has this existential crisis that he doesn't think that he he thinks he does that he's better than everyone, but he don't but he knows in practice he doesn't think he will be better. While Balzado is the opposite, she doesn't she won't tell anyone she's better than better than her because she knows she's better than them. And so you know he kind of. She kind of has, you know, these opposite attracts sort of thing with Bowser. But at the same time, they're both Koopas. They both love violence. They both love over-the-top theatrics. Uh, they're both very headstrong and stubborn. Uh, they both love fire. They both like, you know, they both love a lot of the same things. They both love their family. So, you know, they have same they have same things, but they have the opposite. However, if you look at Bowser over the course of the story, that's when you get that she's a very weird character. At points throughout not only this story but also the entire uh, the entire series, Wakazu it looks like Wakazu doesn't truly know what to do with her, which is kind of a shame because she is a very good character. It's just she was she came this gray area where you don't know at that she kind of keeps flip flopping between whether she's a Mary Sue or whether she's not she's not a Mary Sue. That's the really weird part about her character. Is the fact she constantly flip flops. She constantly changes, becomes static for a little bit, becomes a Mary Sue, and then she gets through like a minor character development. It's like, okay, she's out of, she's not a Mary Sue anymore. But then it kind of it keeps flipping, fl uh, flipping back and forth. So it makes it really, really hard to tell what was the whole, oh, what her overall arching character is. Besides, I just want to make my kids happy. Um, so that made her probably the hardest character of the story to that, to kind of examine. She's actually one of those characters that I think deserves her own video because she's just really, really weird. You know, kind of like Valkyrie. Valkyrie is kind of an anomaly too, where, you know, Sue characters aren't exactly a bad thing if you know what you're doing. Uh, but Valzella, but overall, you know, she, she's very gray, but in this, in this story she starts out as a very obvious mary sue but then over the course of the story she kind of goes through a lot of character development of her really really genuinely caring about her family granted that's kind of mitigated by the fact that we don't really see a lot of time put into caring about her family more about taking over everything um and you know kind of kind of going from a very flat one-dimensional character to a three-dimensional character at the near the end, and then, but in, th in this case, she's an okay character. Like I said, it flip flops constantly throughout the, throughout all four stories. It 
flip-flops constantly. So it's really, really hard to get an accurate gaze on her character. I probably have to go bit by bit and story by story over, you know, what what's going to be, what's done with her throughout the series. So in this story, she starts out as a one-dimensional, very revenge-driven uh, character. You know, she wants to kill Bowser for kind of ruining her fan, her family's life, and then by extension, ruining her life. Uh, getting mocked for being ripped by being seen as a ripoff of ba of Bowser, despite the fact she points out she's technically a year older than Bowser. Uh, and then she, this is when we start the Mary Sue stuff. You know, she's constantly being Bowser. She's constantly being smarter than Bowser. She's smart, outsmarting everyone. She's constantly manipulating everything to go exactly how she wants it. And while you know there are there are people like that in real life, and those are characters. The fact that she's kind of doing it a little too easily, and she doesn't have any flaws, kind of makes her, you know, a Mary Sue. But then the second half, once Mario and Luigi shows up, that's when we get her to become three dimensional. She becomes, um, she becomes stubborn. She she shows lots of weakness. She shows that she really does care about her family. She she starts making mistakes. Uh, she inadvertently puts her family in danger by doing this. Uh, she comes to rely on Cammy some because she realizes there's not much she there, you know there's stuff that she can't do. She shows lots of weak she she shows vulnerabilities, and so you know by the at the beginning when she's first introduced to when the Mario brother shows up she's very much Mary Sue. The moment the Mario brother show up she you know she grows she becomes a full fledged character, and so you know you start loving her. And so at the end, where, you know, she's desperate enough that she completely abandons her baby because she's so desperate to want want to make Bowser and prove and, and want to get that one essential victory and not be screwed over by the stars. She, you know, she gets stuck in another dimension for who knows how many years. And, you know, she, you know, she's screwed over royally by everything that's happened. You know, you, you feel some symphony, symphony for her. And so she becomes a very good character. Pacing. Uh, nothing wrong with pacing. It's fine, you know. I really wish they could. I I think the only thing that's really rushed was the whole point with the Koopalings. I just think maybe, you know, just have Bowser to get to know and Bowser kind of get to know the Koopalings at least a little bit before, you know, just saying, hey, let's do our next big plan. Okay. Uh, grammar. There are. I think there was a couple of grammars. However, that's mainly due to uh, Ludwig and Roy, you know, having like the the German and the Brooklyn accent. So it kind of makes it hard to say, say if they're really grammar errors or they're just the way they talk normally. Eh. And so that is my review of Queen of the Koopas. I think it's an overall decent start. It does have some flaws. Uh, Balzel is still an anomaly. Like I said, she she we're gonna talk about more about her as the story goes along. Uh, the pace is good, not great, but good. And there's no grammar except possibly unintentional on my part with Ludwig and Roy. Um, do I recommend this story? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put the recommended stuff until the end of until I review Super Koopa World, mainly because if I'm going to review a four part story that I want to recommend whether or not to recommend the entire story or not, so I'm gonna skip that. Favorite part? Um, That's one hard to do. Uh, I would have to say probably more how Morton was born with like I, I really love how they what what Wakazu did with Morton, like how he was born, like you know Bowser's like uh, Bowser is kind of giving birth, uh, giving birth to the next egg after Morton, and Bowser's like keeping an eye on the egg because he realizes. Like at the same time where she start, you know, she's starting to gain contractions. He realizes that the egg is cracked. He's like, "Oh no, I have to, I have to show her. I have to show my wife the egg." But, but sir, but she's giving, she's giving birth right now. It's like, <laughs> and so barges in, and like all the other Koopalings born so far are 
are um you know watching her and he spent like uh before the hand he had a like little get uh daughter father saw daughter or speak with wendy wendy was the only uh koopaline that kind of had some development which is kind of sad okay. Uh, and so, you know, he's trying to, Bowser's trying to show Bowser his wife. So look, the egg's cracking, the egg's cracking. And he's like, ah, Bowser, stop it, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> and then, and then all the other Koopalings, they start arguing over some inane things, and Wendy's like, Daddy, you're not paying attention to me. And like, and so every, all this stuff's going around and about, and like, everyone's just arguing. And then little Morton Jr. kind of shows up, poof. And he's like, and he's like looking at all, all the arguing, all the yelling, and he goes, <laughs> and he starts mumbling, hence why, you know, he has, if you see it throughout the stories, he has like a fast talking thing. Like I said, all the stories, uh. We're, we're introduced to their quirks, like, very early. Um, so that way, you know, you, you kind of get to introduce to each one and, you know, what their personality is going to be going on, like, going forward. But I just like Morton because that one was hilarious. And that one was actually entertaining. Um, what would I change? Honestly, I think you'd... Uh, I can't really do much because, you know, Wakazoo's passed away. Maybe if someone adopts the stories and kind of reworks them. Uh, the themes need to be better defined in the story. Uh, and Bowser needs to have a little more time with... Bowser and Bowser needs a little more time with the Kooplings. Enough to get at least get the baseline of their character. Like what they're gonna be, what they're gonna be like and everything. Like what Bowser did with Wendy. You know, like stuff like that. That would be helpful. So that is is my review on Queen of the Koopas. The next story I'm going to be reviewing is the first story in the Super Koopa trilogy, Super Koopa. Super Koopa. I just realized that sound that sounds pretty cool when you when you see when they say it like this. Super Koopa. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Super Koopa. Uh so it is so I wish you a happy Halloween. I will be posting a couple videos tomorrow on Halloween. This has been Dark Symphony 777, and cut!